Well, let's look at the reference. If somebody else wants to testify or whatever, you get on your feet. We'll take a, a reference, and while you look at the reference, in the book of 1 Kings, chapter number 18, we will begin reading with verse number 21. If you're ready for the reading, praise the Lord. 1 Kings, chapter number 18, and beginning reading at verse number 21. <clears throat> See, there's nobody up, so I'll proceed as God would help us. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I only, remain a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let them therefore give us two bullocks, and let them choose one bullock for themselves and cut it in pieces and lay it on wood and put no fire under. And I will dress the other bullock and lay it on wood and put no fire under. And call ye on the name of your gods and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God that answereth by fire let him be God. And all the people answered and said, It is well spoken. And Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal, Choose you one bullock for yourselves and dress it first, for ye are many, and call on the name of your gods, but put no fire under. And they took the bullock which was given them, and they dressed it, and called on the name of Baal from morning even until noon, saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, nor any that answered, and they leaped upon the altar which was made. And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry unto Cry aloud, for he is a God. Either he is talking, or he is pursuing, or he is in a journey, or peradventure he sleepeth, and must be awaked. And they cried aloud, and cut themselves after their manner with knives and lancets, till the blood gushed out upon them. Came to pass when midday was past, and they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, there was neither voice nor any to answer nor any that regarded. And Elijah said unto all the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took twelve stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two measures of seed. And he put the wood in order, and cut the bullock in pieces, and laid him on the wood, and said, Fill four barrels with water, and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. And he said, Do it the second time. And they did it the second time. And he said, Do it the third time. They did it the third time, and the water ran round about the altar, and he filled the trench also with water. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. 
Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is the God. Well, hallelujah. Amen. Glory. In this particular passage of Scripture, Elijah did some praying. And as he prayed, it just seemed like he locked the heavens up and stuck the key in his pocket and walked off and said there won't be any more rain till I do some more praying. And three and one half years without any rain. Now that's a long time without any rain. A few days and grass gets brown here and different problems arise. But three and a half years would be a long time to go without rain. And of course, the famine was getting bad in three and one half years. And then Elijah came challenging the people to settle the question. I really got amazed when I noted really what took place here. When he came to challenge the people to settle the question, I thought it was rain that they needed. And uh, I'm confident they did. But that wasn't the real question. That was not the real question. The real question is you've got to settle is who do you worship as God? Isn't even related so far as just the rain itself is concerned. But who do you worship as God? That was their big question. And that's always the big problem. That's the big problem of this nation today. The big problem is who do we worship as God? Watergate was not our main problem in this nation. White water is not the main problem in this nation. There's some things about those areas that I certainly do not like. But anyway, that's not the big problem. Oh, no. No, it's not the big problem. The big problem is, who do we worship as God? Now, God's cause is so incontestably just that you need never fear to have the evidence of its equity searched into and weighed, weighed out. Really, our problems, we have lots of gods and lots of problems, and, but really, our problem is not TV. I think there's a great deal of damage that's been done by TV. That's not the main problem facing this nation. It's not the wrong use of VCR that's the big problem of this nation. It's not the amusement world which is big problem, but it's not the big problem that we have to face up to, friends. Oh, no, there's a lot of gods. And, but I want to tell you, our problem is the same problem that Israel had who are we worshiping as God? Who do you worship? Let me, let's bring it home right here in this camp meeting today. Who are you worshiping as God? So the first problem then to settle and the first problem now to settle is who is God? No need to pray for rain until you get the main problem settled. It'll only confuse the issues worse. I don't care how long and how loud people may pray about the rain. It'll only confuse the issue. They need to get settled on the main problem is who they worship is God. And if we can get that issue settled, we're a long way up the road. Who do we worship as God? Who will we worship as God? Really, the people in those days had a mixed form of worship. There were times when they worshipped Baal to please the queen and king. And there were other times they worshipped Jehovah to please the prophets. And they had a mixed form of worship. And this is the issue that Elijah knew that would have to get settled before they could get the rain. And so he came and challenged the people to face the real issue and the real question. Do you worship Baal or are you worshiping Jehovah? And that's the question then. And that's the question that I'm posing to you here now. 
And of course, there can be but one infinite, all-sufficient God. And that's all there can be, only one infinite, all-sufficient God. And that's all there can be. And if upon trial, friends, and if upon trial, Baal proves out to be that one infinite, all-sufficient God, then worship Baal. And if Jehovah proves out to be the one, in, the one infinite, all-sufficient God, then worship him and have nothing to do with Jezebel. So Elijah proposed that the matter go to trial. And uh, if Baal's God, we'll all worship Baal. If Jehovah is God, we'll all worship Jehovah God. And let me tell you, Baal is a cheat. And there isn't any question about it. I think you know that already. And uh, if he is a cheat, then we don't need to have anything to do with him. We need to declare ourselves that once and for all, we are going to worship the great, sovereign, eternal Jehovah God. And we're coming out on his side, and we'll tell the world, we'll tell everybody, we'll tell our children, we'll tell our grandchildren, we'll tell everybody, we're going to worship God. We'll have nothing to do with the false gods. I wish that could be said truthfully across the holiness movement. Let me tell you, there's a lot of gods. There's a gold god. A lot of people worship him. Oh, they may go to church on Sunday, but they'll worship the gold god all of the week. There's the jewelry god, and they'll pay their homage to him. They may act like they're Christians. They like to stand up and make believe that they're Christians and give a little word of some sort of testimony and maybe think they're convincing you that they're really worshiping Jehovah God while at the same time the rest of the week they'll pay homage to the jewelry God. There can be all kinds of gods in our day and there is. You could just name lots of them and go down the line, but we can't deviate particularly at this point in that direction. And when we look at gods today, which God will we worship them? Now, sir, father, mother, sons and daughters, I'm talking to you on this Sunday morning. If we can arrive at a conclusion, however we arrive at it, if we can arrive at the conclusion that there is only one God and we declare and are convinced that he is the great sovereign Jehovah God and we're going to pay our homage to him and we'll pay no attention to other false gods all around us. If we can get that much settled, there's only one God and that this Bible is his word, it'll settle a lot of things in our lives. For instance, if you're convinced that there's only one God and this book is his word and the book says remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, that settles the issue for you on that problem. Amen. Oh, thank God. Some of us don't have it settled so good, I think. But when you get the issue settled and that the Lord's day is still the Lord's day and we ought to honor that day and behave ourselves properly on that day, we got the matter settled. We're not going to play with the false gods. We're not going to do homage to them. We're going to keep our eyes set on the main God, on the one God and worship him and adore him and serve him regardless what other people may do. Are you really settled? Or somebody said, I thought you can get the ox out of the ditch if he gets in the ditch on the Lord's day. And I think that's a safe philosophy. But I do think another addition to that philosophy ought to be said, if the same ox gets in the same ditch too often, then either sell the ox or fill the ditch up. <laughs> One of the two. If we get it settled, there's one God and we're going to worship him and we read in the Bible where it says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. You can depend on it. We'll do our best to do it. Amen. Oh, thank God. I know a lot of little people that have a little profession. Just give them time and a half and they'll go on the job on the Lord's day. They'll make no great effort to get off. 
I'm finding most people who make a sincere effort to get off of the duties on the Lord's day, if they'll live consistent otherwise, many times they'll, they'll find leniency on the part of those they have to talk to. Oh, that God in heaven would help us. If you believe that there's one God and that this Bible is his word and you read in that word that the tithe is the Lord's, that settles the issue on it. That's the final word. Whatever the Bible says is the final word on it. The tithe is the Lord's. You say, I never covenanted to tithe. You don't have to covenant to tithe. It's part of God's program. The book said the tithe is the Lord's. That's what the book said about it, friend. You ought to have no trouble understanding that. One God, the Bible is his word, and we get the issue settled. Now, the people who halt at this point on, on being resolved that there's one God, their convictions are not very stable nor very strong. And I think this is part of a problem in these days that we live. There's not many people that seem to have much of a conviction in these days on things. It just seems we have concluded that everybody else is doing it and we can do it too and get by with it. But many people are unsteady in their purposes and unsteady in their promises. And they'll come to camp meeting and God will deal with them and they'll go home purposing they're going to mind God and they're going to put the length of the sleeve where it ought to be and the length of other clothing like it ought to be and it goes about uh, two weeks, maybe a month and you see them and they're back just like they were before camp meeting yes, time came. Yes, so what's the matter with them? They're not sure there's one God. Amen. They're not positive about it. They don't really have it settled. You didn't get it settled. When you get this thing settled once and for all, it'll take a lot of pressure off of you. That there is one God and the Bible is his word and you're going to do your best to live right according to how the Bible tells us to live. It'll get you out of a lot of strain and a lot of problems. You can get so settled on this, thank God, that it's not open for debate. You're not even willing to pray about things. And even the gold gods, you're not interested. You're not even, you're not catering to the gold god. Oh, no, friends. And, and we're living in a day that the only way I would tell you to get out in the clear is to get settled once and for all who is God. I mean, let's get it settled. I mean, everything the Bible's clear on, we get clear on. Right. Take, for instance, the hair gods, the fashion gods, and the Bible gives us clear instruction and clear leadership and clear guidance and women wearing that which pertaineth unto a man. The Bible is clear on it, but a lot of people, they laugh at you and make fun of you and call you no fogey when you go this way. But thank God, when you get the settled, there is only one God and the Bible is his word. You don't have any further trouble getting settled in those issues. You get it settled. And regardless of what the rest of the people may do, you've got her settled, thank God. You know which direction you're going and you're not even open to the debate what you're going to do about it. You got it settled. Settled once and for all that the Bible is God's word. Thus, if you have a difficult, difficult time getting settled on your convictions of dress or your manner of life, it's an indication that you aren't as clear on this matter that there's only one God as you need to be. So Elijah knew the only question they really had to settle is not the matter of rain. They needed rain. The cattle was dying. People was dying of hunger and thirst. And they needed water. They needed water. But before they could get water, they had to get settled on who God is. They had to get straightened out on it. And this is the issue that Elijah challenged them with. He said that God that answers the fire will let him be God. Oh, thank God. I'm glad he said it just like it is. If you are willing to put God first in your life and you are willing to risk everything in time and everything in eternity, 
on it in eternity on this matter that you're sure there's only one God, you're a long way ahead of a lot of people. It's wonderful to get this issue settled, friends. Fifty-seven years ago when Jesus saved me, I embarked on, an, on a project that it was right for a man to man God, for a boy to man God, and it got me a little Bible, a little 29-cent Bible in those days, Printed on newsprint is the best one that I could afford, but it's the same Bible I've got now. Read just like the one I got now, and I read that little old Bible, little thick thing. I'd get alone with God and read it and pray every day till my heart was warmed. And I, I started on the journey, believing that God is sufficient to see a man through. And for these more than a half a century, he's seen me through. He has never had to back down on anything. He told me his Bible, his word has always been right, and it's still right today. And I'm not looking for a new translation that will put a different emphasis on it than what I already have. I believe I found the right way. It's proven good for more than a half a century, and I'm looking toward the sunset, and it's looking better all the time, friends. I see no reason to be in the mullet grubs about this thing. This is the greatest thing in the universe. Go ahead, mind God, settle the issue. Don't pay any attention to the rest of the crowd. This whole world is no friend of grace. It's not going to help you on to God. If you get to heaven, you're going to have to face the issue, and you're going to say, I'm settling the issue. There is only one God, and I worship God and Him alone. I will not, I will not worship other gods. Oh, thank God. It's wonderful to go this way. I'm almost about to say like I heard one man say. He said, I'm so glad God called me to preach so I can feel like I feel right now. <laughs> Praise God. This is the most wonderful thing in this world. And when you get settled on this issue, there's only one God, and you're not changing your convictions, and you're not changing your status, and others can come along, and they'll tell you that I prayed, and I prayed, and I prayed, and I decided the right thing to do is to put my wedding jewelry back on. Let me tell you, sir and ma'am, if you say you pray and you pray and you pray and you arrive at the wrong conclusion, all you were doing in prayer was what Balaam was doing when he prayed the second time. All that he was doing was begging God for the privilege of an indulgence to do what he knew was wrong. And he prayed and he prayed and he prayed and then God said, all right, now you're gone. God had already told him it was wrong for him to go. And now he prayed about it. You may be praying about something that's wrong. It doesn't fit into the biblical plan. And you may arrive at a conclusion that God tells you it's all right. But let me tell you, all you've done is blowed the lights out in your soul. And you've lost your way. And you've gone back to the things that once you gave up. Thousands of people have done it, and thousands of others are doing it in these days, and they're going the wrong way, and they say they prayed about it. It doesn't matter a hill of beans how much you pray about a thing. If you're headed in the wrong direction, all you're doing is going to deceive your own self and think the thing that once you thought was wrong is now right, and you'll end up doing it. <laughs> and you've forsaken the real sovereign, eternal God, you'd rather have your way than to have his way. I'd rather have God's way. I plan to take his way on. It's brought me thus far. I believe he'll take me on too. Oh, hallelujah. Praise God for the way God Almighty marks out for us. Oh, hear me today, friends. If God, God will answer. Elijah said, the God that answers the fire, we'll let him be God. I like the way he stated it. Now, Elijah proposed to bring the matter to a fair trial. Now, Baal had all of the external advantages on his side. For the king and the queen and all the court, they were all for Baal and the people. And the managers of Baal, Baal's cause were 450 men. And then in verse number 22, there's 400 more of their supporters in verse number 19. And the managers of God's cause 
was one man, a poor exile, hardly kept from starving, so that God's cause has nothing to support it but its own right. And that's enough, thank God. That's enough. God and you make a majority at any, at any occasion. If you'll take your stand for God, and they, they are going to settle the issue, and here let each side prepare a sacrifice, and put their sacrifice on the altar and then pray to their God and the God that answers the fire, we will agree that he's God. If neither of them answer, then let the people turn atheist. And if both gods answer, then let them continue to halt between two opinions. Worship God, Jehovah, part of the time. Worship Baal, part of the time. That's what they've been doing, worshiping God part of the time and worshiping Baal part of the time. They had a mixed form of worship up to this point, and the method of answer was the fire. Now, I wondered when I read this passage why Elijah didn't propose maybe, let, why he didn't say, let the God that answers by an earthquake, we'll let him be God. Are the God that answers by commanding the sun to stand still, then we'll know that he's God. But he didn't say either one of those things, for he said the God that answers the fire. Now, fire in the, in the Old Testament nation is a type of the New Testament church, New Testament individual fire. There are three trademarks of Old Testament religion and New Testament individuals. Number one is the Shekinah, the glory, the glory. That, that's the trademark of Israel. They had the glory. Thank God for the glory, that Shekinah, that something that glows, that something that's wonderful, that something that you can understand at least when you, when you begin to comprehend it and see it and see it in people's lives. And that was a trademark of Israel, and that's the trademark of the New Testament Christian. Fire, glory, Shekinah, oh, friends, an individual who professes to be going with God with no Shekinah and no glory is a strange arrangement. And many churches have lost something. They have turned their back on the glory. They have no glory. A lot of churches have no glory. That's right. I mean no glory at all. They come grind the little machinery out and they come and say their little songs and little prayers and give their offerings and they go home, but no fire, no glory, nothing. I mean, nothing to attract them. Nothing that really glows and shines. The second was fire, fire on the altar in the Old Testament. Don't you let the fire go out. That was the command in the Old Testament temple there. Don't you let the fire go out. And, and that's, the, that's the delight in the New Testament Christian. Don't you let the fire go out in your heart. If that fire gets to burning low, if that fire is not burning as it ought to burn, you're, you're, you're not just getting cold, perhaps. You're going to need a trip to the altar to get things repaired. You're going to need to do some real earnest praying to get things back. But why is it that so many people, they lose the fire, and the fire no longer burns in their heart, and they just go on. They go on. Sometimes when there's no fire burning, then we just substitute other things. We put decorations in. We do a lot of things. And we have to have high steeples and thick carpets and, and padded pews and all of it when there's no fire burning. I tell you, when the fire burns in your heart, it doesn't much matter you, with you whether there's a steeple on the church or whether there's carpets on the floor or whether the pews are padded or not. It's that something internal that thrills you and delights you and you have a time when you come together to worship the Lord with others whose, whose like persuasion is like yours. In the Old Testament, the, the, the nation was above all the people. And in the New Testament, we Christians are victorious. And as long as we're obedient, and as long as God's people walked with him, they had the glory, they had the fire, they had the Shekinah. There isn't any question about it, friends. They had the blessing. But it's a sad day when the blessings do not flow, when the fire does not burn, when the Shekinah does not manifest itself, when some old saint gets on their feet. They may not be in the latest coffee. They may not have everything that other people may possess. But when they get up and tell what Jesus Christ has done for them, and they get so blessed, I mean, they get so blessed, and down the aisle they go, 
There's a lot of things that doesn't matter when you begin to consider what we really need. The thing we need is not higher steeples. The thing we need is not thicker carpets. The thing we need is not thicker pews on the path, on the pew, the thicker pads on the pew. The thing we need is the fire of the Holy Ghost burning in our heart and the glory of the Shekinah playing over the congregation and fire just striking like lightning all over the congregation and people shouting and praising God and having a time. But it's a getting pretty scarce. It's a getting pretty, pretty scarce in our day, that kind of services and that kind of meeting. Oh, let's look at the matter a little bit, if we would again. The glory and fire and the blessings. Now, when Abel, Cain and Abel brought their offerings to God, and that's a reputable thing for anybody to do, to bring an offering to the Lord. I don't profess to know all about Cain and Abel, but I have some opinions. When these two boys brought their offerings and placed their offerings on the altar and they waited, I think it was only a matter of a little while till Abel said, Amen. Glory. Hallelujah. Woo! Glory. Hallelujah. Woo! Glory. Hallelujah. Praise God. Cain said, Abel, what's wrong with you? Abel said, okay, praise God, hallelujah, the fire's falling on my offering. My God is respecting my offering. The fires are falling. Woo! Glory, hallelujah. Cain said, Abel, I don't feel a thing. I don't feel a thing. And he didn't. You know, we get into the place where there's Cain's in our congregation. When you get there, I could point you back to a place a man that was given to saying amen and getting blessed. He was a wonderful man. But I've seen him take out his handkerchief while God was blessing and he was wanting to shout, but he knew he is under some severe criticism for his shouting and he'd literally pack his handkerchief into his mouth to muffle his shouts so he wouldn't be a problem to other people. Now that's too bad when that happens, friend. And we're getting to the place some theologues theologians who think they're theologians, they become critical of all emotion and all demonstrativeness, friend, and all the shouting. I want to tell you, when you get settled on the matter, there's only one God, and the fire of that God is burning in your heart, and you're obeying Him to the very best of your knowledge, and you're walking in all the light that He's giving you. I want to tell you, friend, it's a pretty, it would be a pretty hard thing to have to muffle the shouts when you get in that shape. That's too bad. That's too bad. No wonder Elijah said, the big problem we'll have to settle is the problem is God. People are starving. They're thirsty. Animals are dying. Nothing to eat. The grass is dead. The crops are perished. The fruit trees have dried up. There's nothing. There's nothing. And, the fire, and, and there's no God. It's a mixed form of worship. Everybody doing about what they want to do. And that's what a lot of people are doing these days. And they're all not in somebody else's churches either, friend. There's a lot of people, they want to do what you want to do, what you want to do, what you desire to do, and then you'd like to, for God Almighty to bless you, but God doesn't bless you. And maybe some of you have been wondering, oh, why am I not blessed? I was on occasion not long ago, one of the men, one of the leaders said, why is it that I'm not blessed? Why is it that there's no fire in my heart? It, it was pretty evident why it wasn't. He hadn't been true to God. And when you are not true to God, you won't have the blessing, you won't have the fire, you won't have the Shekinah either. You can't. God doesn't give the Shekinah to inconsistency and bad living and people who will not walk in the light. The method is the fire, fire, fire. In the time of Abraham, you remember his sacrifice, the fire descended and consumed his sacrifice. At Sinai, the commandment on how to worship in the tabernacle, a place of offering, said, keep the fire burning. Don't you let the fire go out. We don't need to let the fire from heaven go out and get low in our hearts and in our lives. The baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire is an essential thing, friend. 
I mean, we need it. Everybody needs it. Everybody needs the baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire. If you don't have it, you need it. And you ought to have it. And you ought to get matters settled so good you can get it. There's a way to get this fire. There's a way to have it burning in your heart. If you purpose in your heart to be true to God, Elijah said, all right, take the animal, sacrifice the animal, fix the altar, put the animal sacrifice on the altar. And the prophets of Baal took the, their sacrifice and they placed their sacrifice on the altar. And they began to pray in the morning. And they prayed and they prayed, Oh, Baal, oh, Baal, hear us, Baal. Please hear us, oh, Baal, please let the fire fall. Now, I've often wondered when Elijah made this proposition the God that answers by fire, let him be God. I've often wondered why the prophets of Baal let that go unchallenged. Seemed to me they never had had fire. And now they are accepting and they seem to accept the proposition the God that answers the fire, let him be God. I've arrived at a conclusion the reason they accepted that proposition, it had been so long since they'd seen any fire on anybody's altar, they thought their chance was about as good as anybody else. And there's a lot of people in churches today, there's no fire, but they think their chance of getting to heaven just as good as anybody else because they're frequent in the house of the Lord. All oh, there's times they, they go on excursions to the amusement world. There's time when they do things that they know is, is, is not right nor, nor scriptural, but then after almost everybody's doing other things anyhow, and they think their chance is just about as good as anybody. What, what do we have? What do we have that would really per people would persecute? If they were to start really persecuting the saints, how many of you would they persecute? Is there enough information on you that it caused you to, to receive persecution because they judged you to be saints? My friend, we're, we're living in a peculiar hour. And I, I might as well tell you here, if you get to heaven out of this generation, you can count yourself fortunate. I mean real fortunate if you get to heaven out of this generation where people are doing what they want to do. Not many people are trying to find God's will and God's direction and God's plan and God's program. Thank God for you. Most of you are trying that, but not all of you probably are going that way really. All right, the fire and Baal, hear us. Come time for noon. And still they hadn't heard any voice. Elijah poked a little fun at him. He said, maybe you're not crying loud enough. Maybe your God's going on a journey. Maybe you're going to have to awaken him. He's sleeping. And you're going to have to do something you aren't doing. And they, they leaped on their altars like fools and cut themselves with knives and lances and sacrificed their own blood and pled and screamed and called on Baal, prayed to the evening sacrifice, and still there had been no fire. There had been nothing, I mean nothing taking place, except they just worn themselves out trying to get fire. Now it comes time for the evening sacrifice. And Elijah said, all right, we'll, we'll give it our try now. And the first thing he did, he repaired the altars of the Lord. You know what that tells me? That tells me there's been somebody there before who really worshipped Jehovah God. And they left some footprints in the sands of time so that somebody coming along later, they found those altars and repaired them. You know what I'm afraid of? I'm afraid many of us are going to live our lives and die without leaving any footprints in the sands of time for those to follow who's coming behind us. There was a time you could start talking about nearly anything that's current of the world and somebody would raise a standard and say, not that, that's wrong. I'm not going that way. I'm just not going to do it. Oh, but they repaired the altar of the Lord. They rebuilt those altars. And the sacrifice was killed, placed on the altar. Elijah said, just to make positive and sure, to our opponents here that there's no fire under this altar that's been structured here. Pour four barrels of water over it. 
and they did it. He said, pour four more barrels over it, and they did He said, do it the third time just to be sure they understand there's no fire under this altar. And fill the trench up. And then Elijah, he began to pray. Prayed only a few words. You can read it in 20 seconds, about 64, 65 words, I believe, if I remember right. And, and he prayed his little prayer after he got everything in order. And when he prayed his little prayer, the fire from the Lord fell. I mean the fire fell and consumed the sacrifice and the altar and the stones and the water and licked up the water. I tell you, and the people cried out and said, the Lord, he's God. We're sure now the Lord's God and he's answered the fire. That's wonderful. He's answered the fire. They needed rain. They needed rain. Three and a half years without rain. The grass was dead. The animals were dying. People were dying. They needed water. Now they were ready to find water. They were ready to have water. They got the main issue settled as to who worship, who's going, we're going to worship is God. They got this settled. Elijah, I like the way he did he didn't go out on an excursion and said, I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll sell you some of the ashes that, is, that was left from the fire fell, and you can take them home and spread them across your, your porch somewhere as you walk across every day, and maybe it'll do something for you in the future. No, he didn't say that. He said, we need some rain. And he went out there, and he said to his servant, now you, when he got out on the mountain to pray, most of us would have took quite a while just to go on a speaking engagement and told them what God had done. But not, not Elijah. They needed rain. The people were dying. The cattle were dying. There was no grass. He got down on his knees to pray. <laughs> As he tried to pray, he sent a man to see if there's a little cloud in the sky. And the man came back and said, Master, there's not a cloud in sight. There's not a cloud out there. Elijah helped right on. He said, go back, look again. Go back and look again. And several trips back to look and came back and reported, no cloud out there. Finally, the man had went and looked to another time, and when he returned, he said, there's a little cloud about the size of a man's hand. Elijah said, good enough. There's rain on the way. There's rain on the way. I like what he did about, about old King Ahab. Elijah went over and said, Ahab, if you don't want to get drenched, if you don't want to get wet, you better head for the city. And, Eli and Ahab took out with his nice steeds and his chariots, and he headed for the place where he could get under cover. And Elijah passed him on foot. I want to tell you, it'll put a move on anybody when you hear from heaven. It'll do something for you, thank God. It'll do something out of the ordinary. And he passed him up, and rain was on the way, and they got rain. But they first had to get the matter settled. Who was God? And before this nation ever has a turn back, a real issue turn back to God, we'll have to get straightened out on whom we worship is God. Let's start it right here. And if you're not sure about who God is, let's settle the issue today. Right here and right now, Elijah put it to a proper, a proper test, and it proved out all right. Oh, thank God, the fire fell and consumed the sacrifice, and then they had rain. Oh, thank God. Oh, I want to tell you, God has never failed. When he's been tested, he's been tried, he's always been God. He's never been anybody but God. He never will be anybody but God. He's no less God today than he was on the day Elijah put the matter to test. He's the same blessed eternal God that he's always been. And I wonder, I wonder what we'll do about it. Will you just keep on kind of fluctuating? You get home and some of them put pressure on you and the first thing you know, you say, well, maybe it's not so bad to watch it after all. Maybe that crowd that counts that, that took a stand against it just thinks maybe it's just a, just a bunch of foggy ideas they had. And, and somebody puts pressure on you and said, oh, come on, once won't hurt you. But the tragedy of it is, one time leads to another time. And finally, you lose your position. You've lost out. 
There's people I meet, backsliders all over this nation and in our foreign countries as well. I mean people who once took the way, but they backed down. They got to playing this matter of religion. Yeah. All they wanted is to kind of keep up the good opinion of their fellow man. Really, if I were to convince you that I have old time religion, but if I didn't have it, what has it profited me if I convince you that? Why do people play the hypocrite in this thing and make believe they're all right when they aren't all right? It doesn't profit me anything if I convinced you that I had old time religion but I didn't have it. It doesn't profit you anything if you convince the rest of us that you really had old time religion but if you didn't have it. If you knew you were doing things underhanded, if you knew you had a critical spirit, a difficult spirit, and you were always ready to criticize everybody and everything, and everybody but you is wrong, and you think you're just so right and so good, at least you're trying to put on that frontage. And what, would it, what would it profit you if you don't have it, but if you try to convince others you do have it, it won't profit you anything. God knows you just as you are, and God knows me just as I am. It won't profit me to try to convince you that I'm an old-time second blessing holiness preacher if I'm not that. It wouldn't help me one bit in the world. I want to tell you, friends, but when you get this issue settled, there is only one God, and you don't care what your children or what anybody else says about it. Somebody said, well, why did you get a television? Well, the children put one in. Why does that make any difference? Whose children it was? Why do they want to blame things like that on poor children? Why didn't they have enough of moral courage to stand up and say, I'm telling you now. You just might as well back down. I'm not going to back down. You're the one that'll have to back down. You're the one that's taken the wrong way. You're the one that's doing the thing that's questionable. That's right. Amen. Amen. Oh, friend, across the holiness movement, I've lived long enough to remember the time when you began to see strong evidences. There was jewelry, wedding jewelry, other jewelry began to appear, right. a little scattered. It become more current and more, more of it. And, and then finally you began to see there was a modest dressing. Sleeves are too short, dresses were right, short. Right, right, you right. began to see women wearing that which pertains to a man. You oh, began yeah. to see other things taking place. Women began to cut their hair. Men began to let their hair grow. My friends, we've reached the place where it's going to take some plain talk to get this thing back on course again. Amen. And somebody will have to take right. the sweat of it right. to try to get the thing back on current issues again. I mean, going with God like we ought to go. I remember hearing about one old saintly woman. Oh, how she shouted and praised God. She had a time going to the house of God. She was poor, but she had a time. And finally, it reached the place where her shoes was wore clear out. She didn't have any shoes at all. I mean, they were so worn out. She couldn't, she didn't feel she could hardly go to church at all. Finally, one of her sons was courting a young lady who was of a different brand of religion. And uh, that mother, she was a shouting woman. You hardly got started till she'd be shouting. And so finally, the son saw his, he saw his chance to make a bargain with his mother. He said, Mother, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll buy you a pair of shoes so you can attend church if you promise me not to shout when my girlfriend is there with me. That was his requirement. And she needed the shoes so bad. She, she finally said, All right. And the son bought her a pair of shoes, and the day came, and the son was there with his girlfriend, and that mother was there, and God was blessing, and God was moving, and she was sitting there at the pew having a hard time sitting still, but she was trying to keep her part of the bargain she had made, and finally it reached the point of crisis, and she just reached down and slipped off the shoes and hit the floor and took them over to her son and said, here's your shoes, I've got to shout them. And down the aisle she went praising God and having a hoopy time. We need to forget about our critics. And we need to reclaim this matter and say by the help of God, we're going to take the old-fashioned holiness way. We're going to mount God. We're going to be ready when Jesus comes. 
and we're going to have some glory while we're going. This is not a hardship. It's not a hardship to mind God. It's the greatest thing in the world. It's the most wonderful thing that a human being can have. It's the only thing that will do to live by, and it's the only thing that will do to die by. Oh, I don't want to die by anything else when I get down to the end. One old man, he'd serve God. He'd take the holiness way. There wasn't any question about it. He'd gotten wonderfully sanctified. He was an engineer on the railway lines. He'd engineered the old engines, the old trains up and down the country day after day, in and out the Union stations, day after day. And now he's an old man. Now he's dying. Doctor says he can't live through the day. This will be his day of death. The day's wearing itself by. The doctors are still saying he'll never live through the day. One of the children, there were several children, and one of the children got to thinking, my father has taken the hole in his way without any question. He has been true to God. And now he can't be more than just a few hours away from the glory world. And he said, the child said, I wonder how, how it is with him. And the child mustered up a little courage to ask the father and said, Daddy, tell me, how is it with you now? He was still conscious. He mustered what little energy he had together and looked up and smiled and said, I am right now pulling into the Grand Central Station and all the lights are clear. Isn't that the way you want to go? What's wrong with dying like this? What's wrong with going through leaving this world? All the lights are clear. I'm afraid a lot of people are not going to have a clear light when they get to the end of the journey. If you don't have the matter settled, it's a good time today to let settle this matter as to who you're going to worship is God. Don't talk about having the matter settled if you try to settle by going to church on, sun, on Sunday morning to please grandma and going out to the amusement occasions on Sunday afternoon. You don't have it settled. But why don't you get it settled like it ought to be and say, I'm willing to pay the price. I'm willing to do what God wants me to do regardless of what my brothers or my sisters or my parents or anybody else does. I'm going with God. I wish you'd stand with me, please. Maybe we ought to have a little music at least for just a few moments. Amen. Are there those in this assembly today? Amen. You say, Brother Reagan, I'm not sure I've got this matter settled. You say, I've been to the altars before. I thought I had it settled, but I got under some pressure and I found out it wasn't settled as well as I thought it was. And I'd like to do some praying. And I'd like to tell you something else. I'm not going to take a position that you'll have to bow at an altar. I'm going to tell you, as you stand right there in your pew, you can say by the help of God from this moment on, I'm going to settle all issues right here and right now. There's only one God who is Jehovah God, and I'm going to worship him, and I'm not going to have anything to do with the rest of the God. I'm going to take God's way. I wonder... I wonder if anybody, if anybody wants to pray. If you want to pray, this is a good atmosphere to pray in. If I had a need, I'd want to come to an altar like this because there's people here that would help me to pray. You want to pray? Anybody here, you're not sure you got to settle? You've been wavering a little. You've been up and down. You've been in and out as it were. And you'd like to get it settled once and for all. You'd like to get it settled. Anybody here want to pray? We'll wait a little bit. We'll wait a little bit. We're waiting just a little for you. If somebody's, you say, I know I'm out of line. I'm not where I ought to be. There's a good many people around these days who've seen better days than what they're now having. Anybody want to pray this morning?
it's immaterial with me whether you bow at an altar or whether you settle it out your pew or whether you settle it by your bedside or the couch side or out in the woods. Not too long ago, I held the camp meeting to really help people to get through to victory. You almost had to try to get to them immediately when the altar call was had been answered for somebody to get to them and talk them up before you had time to get there. We're not interested in talking to anybody up. I want you to get this thing settled so when you get back home and the pressure's on you, you can stand right up and say, I got this thing settled. I'm going with God. I'm going to mind God. And I know what he wants me to do. And others may laugh at you. And others may call you an old fanatic. Others may call you an old fogey. But what does it matter what they call you? If you get this matter settled to go with God, you're ahead. Anybody, anybody care to come to pray? What we need to do, let's just bow our head, turn the whole matter into a little prayer time here. Everybody pray.